Power by Ecotec. Both these stores, awesome, close to each other, and you know, different offering. Uh, really cool replicas of each other. But uh, I see behind me is the thing that, like, the, where the magic happens, like the behind the scenes of the candy factory. You see behind those windows, is huh? here. I see tanks here that uh, have transformed since I was there. Uh, they were ideas of how we were going to yeah. farm corals. Now it's actually happening. So why don't we take him to the farm and let's go see Josh back there, man. Let's go find Josh. Right, come on, come on in. When I was here two years ago, uh, I saw the vision, which was big giant tanks up front uh, where you grow them all out, uh, the mother colonies. And then these guys weren't quite full yet because uh, you had just opened. Now, as many corals as you could possibly imagine everywhere you look. And by looking at it, you can tell how much is actually aquaculture because they don't make it here unless they're a generationally proven coral. I have uh, my own idea of why I like aquaculture corals, but give me yours. They're super hardy. They don't change color unless your system is not doing well. Um, they will ship extremely well. I think you can pretty much choose the coral based on what you like from one of the display colonies that we have, which is a major advantage. Um, and you already know what they're gonna do in your tank because you can see it for yourself. You know, that is the, the bit of it, I think, that people overlook. You hear aquaculture and you think, oh, great for the environment, it's the green way to do it, uh, we're not pulling corals out of the ocean. And there's like a group of people, man, that's super duper important to you'd only buy it that way, just for that reason alone. Mm -hmm. The other part of it, though, is like, if I'm buying it out of the wild, I pull it out of Fiji, it flew to LA, sat in a holding bin, went to uh, some other regional wholesaler, went to a fish store, sat there forever, who knows, right? Yep. And there's some corals that just have to go through that because they're not really like easily farmable or they're unique in some manner. But all of these things, you've cherry picked the best out of everything you have it's pest free, it's healthy, uh, it will stay the same color, it was grown under the same artificial lighting that you use at your house in artificial seawater, and instead of going through all that transit, I'm grabbing one out of here, I'm putting it in a bag, I'm shipping it right to your house. The amount of transport and all this stuff means, like, it's gonna be a healthier pet, it's going to be as beautiful as I thought it was gonna be, and like, I'm not gonna have mortalities that are associated with it. it. means it's actually cheaper in the end. Well, we're doing the hard part, right? I mean, you can bring in corals direct on your own. You'll probably get them cheaper. You'll probably be really excited about a, a new coral, only to find out months down the road it's not the same thing. It could potentially die on you. You know, all the things that we're already saying, it, we, we've done the hard part. And by doing what we do, we also feel we're doing our part, you know? How many, how many corals are stuck in a bag and shipped across the world? You know, in this situation, we're shipping it across the country, but it's, a, it's from our facility. So I think of the fish uh, portion of the business, which is, it's hard. It's hard to breed fish. Haven't figured out the whole scale of it. We're on the path, but like, this is proof in the pudding. They're like, there's really no need to pull the stuff out of the ocean. It's just yeah. sometimes theoretically cheaper, but it's not really cheaper if they die or change yeah. color and you're not getting what you wanted. And you made a good point. It's really scalable, mm -hmm. you know? If we had twice the amount of space and twice the amount of the people that we have that care, we could do this again. So if you stopped selling coral for two months, double this whole thing? It's hard to say. I mean, would, would we be able to keep up with the overlapping and the threat from one coral to the, to the other? I don't know. Because that's part of what we do here too is we're trimming based on aggression. Mm -hmm. We're trimming based on choice frag, but that has to go at some point. We can't just hold and hold and hold because those perpetually get bigger. So they showed me uh, uh, what is how big is the tank up front? Uh, 1500 the, or the yeah, 1500. Okay. So there's the 1500, and the first thing you said is on a bad week, a bad one. 250 francs coming out of this thing. Yeah. So so if if we're not in there as you know, frequently or as diligently as we normally are, 
250 frags a week is a really bad week, but we produce up to 400. You know, on a, on a really killer week where we're, we'll, we can actually remove a duplicate colony, how many corals can one colony make, or frags, so to speak, mm -hmm. you know? And the point is to not chop them down into a million pieces, but you're getting a more survivable animal if we appropriately size the frag for the bag. I mean, that is the one piece, like, if I wish I could tell the world and, like, I just keep repeating it, I hope, that, like, enough people hear that message, but it's that, like, if it's farmed, it's not just uh, ecologically a good idea. It's better for you, better for your tank. You're not gonna get pests in there that will bother your other tanks, or other uh, corals that are in the tank. You are gonna get that healthier pet, man, that you're gonna be happier with. I just don't think that that message has permeated across. You see the little you know, tag or something on a coral that says aquaculture. Mm -hmm. Like, it should say better. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt. That's awesome. Uh, you know, when I think about it, like I asked earlier, I, I walked over there and I saw, you know, some of the corals. You're talking about how sometimes, you know, you get a really cool specimen and then, you know, you'll eventually go through quarantine and make its way over here to mm -hmm. be farmed. And I was surprised to see that you could effectively do euphilia at scale. Uh, and the first thing you said was, with the torches, I asked if you could do it, mm -hmm. and you said, yep, we got to make sure it's healthy first. Mm -hmm. right? So. Explain the difference between a aquaculture torch and a wild torch and what you could expect between the two. Well, number one, first of all, we always say a wild euphilia is like a 70-30 chance. 70% it's gonna make it, 30% it's not. If you take an aquaculture torch and leave it on the water for more, more time than you should, let's say it almost dries out and you put it back in the water, that torch is probably going to make it. You can't do that with a wild coral. Um, the fact that they come with the nastiest euphilia flatworms from the wild, the fact that the skin can just completely bail off them in a single day, that doesn't happen with a captive torch. Most of the time, you're gonna get a different color, you're gonna get a different growth structure, and you're gonna get a different, um, I don't wanna say, a length of tentacle because you see some of those like Australian ones or even some of the, the Indonesian ones that have the really shallow tentacle mm -hmm. and they're wide, almost more like a thumb than a pinky. Mm -hmm. um, those, they'll either stretch out or they'll get stubbier. You really never know, but in aquaculture torch, they all pretty much look the same. Is what it is. Mm -hmm. So do you avoid things like brown jelly and stuff uh, with a, a, a aquaculture coral versus a, a wild? It's less predominant, but no, you don't avoid it. It's so, so the way that we look at it is, it's secondary infection. Okay. You know, that's just how they die. So when you get brown jelly in an A can or you get brown jelly in a, in a euphilia, it's all secondary infection. If you can remove the infection and get it into some sort of antibac treatment of, of whatever variety that you choose is best for you, it will stop. Okay. It's pretty incredible. So yeah, I mean, all around, dude, healthier coral, it's gonna look the way that it looks when you bought it, it's not gonna change. And you get to feel good about essentially creating an arc of coral in your own home that didn't take anything out of the wild, man, like a net positive to the universe. Uh, I don't know, you look around, dude, and you're seeing it scale. Two years ago, uh, these things were not full. Now they're full to the brim. Mother colony tanks up front, filling them out. 200 to 400 tanks coming out of dis uh, core, uh, frags coming out of display tanks to feed these things, and scalable. This thing could be uh, twice the size in a short period of time if we just push the demand uh, to want to be better, not just for the world but for ourselves. So you mentioned the euphilia. Surprise that that could be aquaculture. What do you think about the variety? I am shocked by actually how many things that you guys are growing effectively. There's lots of things that I, I wouldn't have thought of. And I remember back, uh, I think it was Anthony Kelfo showed me how to do, or showed, I should say me, so showed us at an iMac how to grow euphilia. But he's like, dude, it's super duper slow. Clearly you guys have uh, perfected uh, the technique to make it actually scalable. So you, know, you have to, as a business, make it profitable. Otherwise you wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you make it profitable and scalable, now it's great for everybody involved and sustainable. There is something that we've learned over time though. You can't aquaculture everything unless you have a lot of space. You know, and you'll look around and see that there's, there's things you'll, you'll see more 
volume of because that's something that either we thought was more important to take up the square footage with, mm -hmm. or it just grows really fast, but it also sells well. Cabbage mm. leather is a perf perfect example. How often do you see cabbage leather for sale in places? Uh, you know, I haven't been to a lot of fish stores lately, mm -hmm. so tell me. You probably won't. We have one variety that's as neon as they get, but it was important for us to grow that because it doesn't die. It grows really well. It's really super bright and it's an easy coral to keep. We have a lot of beginner hobbyists to shop with us. Super bright, it's that, that's like the singularia, right? Like those leathers that are just pop, man. Yeah. How can you not love it? So, you know, all those things considered, we do try to focus on those type of coral. Monopora is a really good grower. Zoanthids are a really good grower. Leather is a really good grower. And your favorite, Acropora. We grow the daylights out of it. A lot of people really like acros. You know, it's funny because this would have at one point been the coral that everybody thought was like the hardest to keep, you know, when I entered the hobby. This is the easiest coral to farm. I, maybe easiest is a strong word, but mm -hmm. it is very, very achievable to grow acros at, at scale. It is. Uh, there's a lot of other corals, though, that here you guys are pushing the limits on. And uh, yeah, reality is, is you don't know unless you try, you know? Sure. And you can find ways that uh, you can get them to grow uh, in captivity faster than you had thought uh, and change the way that we think about these things. Euphilia, largely at one point, would have almost been predominantly 100% wild caught. Yeah. We can change the trajectory of that. Like uh, bubble tip and enemies here. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't see a reason why anybody would ever take one of these out of the ocean ever again. When, I mean, when it does that in, the, in captivity, right? Yeah, well, what possible reason? Like, this is gonna be healthier. It's, and I'm not just getting some random rose and enemy either. I'm getting this, which is stunning. You know, yeah. I know what I'm getting. It's gonna look like this in my tank, and I'm gonna be super happy with it. Why would I get it any other way? And how many do you have to try from the wild in order to get that one type as the result? That one's incredible. I mean, to me, it's one of the brightest anemones mm -hmm. and, and definitely the most survivable. You know, when we had uh, the uh, uh, clown harem tank, mm -hmm. we had the same thing, man. I bought a bunch of anemones that were wild from a wholesaler, and dude, like half of them didn't make it. Or know? turned ugly. Yeah, <laughs> and they were not cool. Uh, if you go look at the videos, the tank was cool, but the anemones, man, <laughs> could have been so much better. If I had started here, I wouldn't have had any of the mortalities, I wouldn't take anything out of the ocean, and I'd be way, way, way happier with the result because it would look stunning. It's a good message, man. That's why we do what we do. I came out here for the 360 to uh, fill up my own tank. We called it Willy Wonka because you get to go through and uh, the candy factory and uh, pick out whatever you like.